On This Week in Enterprise Tech, Snapchat gets hacked, or do they? Follow the Yellow Silk Road, and Cameron Crandall from Kingston comes on to talk about crazy fast storage. Twine on the set. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for This Week in Enterprise Tech is provided by CashFly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Twyatt. This Week in Enterprise Tech, Episode 111, recorded October 13th, 2014. PCIE SSDs with Kingston. This Week in Enterprise Tech is brought to you by Mandrill. Mandrill is a scalable, reliable, and secure email infrastructure service trusted by more than 300,000 customers. Sign up at mandrill.com, promo code TWIT, and you'll receive 50,000 free email sends per month for your first six months of service. Welcome to Twyatt This Week in Enterprise Tech. It's the show dedicated to the enterprise professional, the IT pro, and the geek who just wants to know how the world is connected. I'm your host, Father Robert Balasair, the digital Jesuit, your guide to all things in the enterprise. But of course, I'm not guiding you by myself. I've got my trusty co-host, my cohorts, my partners in IT crime, starting with Mr. Brian Chi, the director of the Advanced Network Computing Laboratory, who is holding up a new toy for us t I know you like your toys, so go ahead and tell us what this one is. This is an Iridium modem. Oh, no way. Me, yeah, it was uh, like 250 bucks, and I'm blowing 65 bucks, and it gives me a full month of unlimited email and unlimited SMS from anywhere on the globe. Wait, I thought the Iridium satellite system had fallen out of space already. No, very popular. And uh, these are... Uh, burst radio so they send only 160 characters at a shot and it uses very very little iridium satellite time so the cost is very low so you won't be uh, downloading youtube videos but you can stay connected no matter where you are in the world yeah i'm actually seriously thinking about doing facebook updates from when i'm out to sea in two weeks wait chibert is this part of that i'm not a spy kit no, 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 no. This is the scientist hat. We're actually going out and repairing and upgrading the Aloha Cabled Observatory in three miles of water. Well, sir, we look forward to uh, seeing your satellite tweet updates. Now, joining us not from satellite is uh, the other co-host for This Week in Enterprise Tech, a good man, but more than that, a good friend. That's right, Mr. Curtis Franklin from Information Week. Curtis, how are you doing in the sweaty coast? Uh, Padre, I'm doing well. I'm glad to be back after two weeks on the road. Was at uh, the last Interop New York ever, uh, and then went straight from there to Gartner Symposium. And uh, it's nice to be back with uh, with Twyatt. Nice to be back in the swamp. Well, gentlemen, and uh, later in the show, we're going to be talking a little bit a little bit about super fast flash memory storage for the enterprise. But first. Let's get to the Enterprise Blips. The first story comes to us from Network World, all about Salesforce unleashing a new wave for cloud analytics. That's right, 100,000 people descended upon the Bay Area this weekend and this week for the Dreamforce Conference in San Francisco. And one of the biggest announcements made by the CRM giant Salesforce was the introduction of Wave, a suite of analytic tools that have been in development for more than two years. Unlike legacy analytic tools, Wave is search-based, meaning that customers can look for trends and nexus points rather than just data correlations. Wave can be accessed on mobile devices and will be available for Salesforce solutions and apps using the Salesforce platform. Pricing will be based on the number of users. Well, my story comes from Ars Technica, and aha, Google convinced the appeals court to move the Rockstar case out of East Texas. In a risky move, Google took the chance of taking their appeal to the top patent court in the country to move the case from Plano, Texas to California by convincing the court that the judge to hear the case in Texas abused discretion. If they had lost, well, they may have had to sit before a pissed off judge. The quote is, the district court clearly erred by crediting and indeed according great weight to Rockstar's made for litigation satellite office in Plano, Texas, wrote the Google lawyers in their petition. 
All right, Google. Well, they probably had to fly to get there, and flight attendants aren't feeling the mobile device love. The largest flight attendants union has sued the FAA, seeking to force the government agency to reinstate the ban on mobile electronic devices during takeoffs and landings. Unconvinced that the new era of humorous safety announcements is having an effect, and tired of impatient vacationers unloading overhead bins as the plane's wheels touch the ground, the attendants want your attention to be focused on them and their rockin' PA sounds rather than the 498th viewing of Frozen. Now, the union is making its legal arguments on procedural grounds, saying that a formal rules-making process should have been followed prior to changing the regulations. Keep an eye on the court proceedings, but hey, not during takeoff and landing. We'll keep you posted as this suit moves forward. Well, mine's a little bit higher in the air. Well, maybe not quite as high. In this case, the drone developers get a big open source boost from the Linux Foundation with dr the Drone Code Project. In a move that looks to do for drones what standardization did for Ethernet, the Linux Foundation is launching the Drone Code Project to create a common platform for drone software that promises to really kickstart the fledgling industry. The founding members of drone the Drone Code Project consist of companies with expertise in drones or robots, including Robotics, Body, Box, Drone Deploy, J Drones, Laser Navigation, Skywards, Squad Drone System, Walker, and Unique. Aw, you think you have fast Wi Fi? That's so cute. Just as 802.11ac is gaining a foothold in the world of Wi Fi, Samsung hopes to steal its thunder with a new 60 gigahertz millimeter wave wireless technology that boasts a blistering 4.6 gigabits per second of throughput. Samsung claims that this breakthrough was made possible by, by the development of tech that overcomes the 60 gigahertz band's susceptibility to signal attenuation and path loss. Specifically, they used a micro beam forming antenna that reshapes the RF energy 3,000 times a second to keep it targeted on the client while eliminating multi-path bounce interface. In other words, cool. That's it for the blips. Let's go ahead and move on to the bites. The first one is, uh, well, it seems like a small story, but it actually does have some serious ramifications for the enterprise. And that's about Snapchat being, quote unquote, hacked. Now, Snapchat is arguably the originator and definitely the most popular of the ephemeral messaging providers. The idea is that it gives users a way to share photos, videos, texts, and drawings with other users. Now, users can set a time limit for, for viewing the content, and supposedly after that time limit expires, the content is deleted from the Snapchat servers and is no longer available on the ShareEase device. Now, the data is supposed to be gone, but there have been a couple of scandals over the past few months, including one that just happened last week, that has thrown that into question. But before we get into that, I, I want to bring my co-host into this to talk about ephemeral messaging. Uh, this has been big on the consumer side. Snapchat is actually fantastically high in the traffic charts. But Cheaper, throwing it to you first, what's the use of ephemeral messaging in the enterprise and business? Because it seems that more and more of these collaboration tools and enterprise suite tool producers are jumping on the ephemeral messaging bandwagon. Well, it's, it's I kind of think of it as a way of replacing the old pagers you know, being able to send status messages and keep up to date. Because remember, it's all about service now. How can the IT groups respond to problems faster than traditional ways? And, you know, you, you really and truly want to know about problems before your customers do. So when you have something nice and fast and ephemeral, you don't want old messages laying around. You want them nice and fast and only up to date. And I, I see this as a way of replacing pagers nice okay well curtis let me ask you about that that, that whole idea of the disappearing data uh, of course that's going to strike chords in it with this idea of data management as an it manager i would love to have the ability to time out delete get rid of otherwise dispose of any data that should not be on my network any longer but what do you see as the allure of having any sort of collaboration suite that lets you say, take back an errant message or delete information that is no longer valid? Well, I think that this is actually an extension of something that has existed in a lot of companies as a policy involving paper records and documents for quite a while. You know, we get wrapped up about how to, uh, in a stable and secure way, keep data for a long time. 
The flip side of that is that it's important to know what to do with information that needs to be gone at the end of each business day. For example, I know my dad was an engineer with General Dynamics. They had a policy that said you could not use scratch paper. Uh, every uh, employee got a deck of three by five cards and a little wallet to put them in. Those were for your during the day memos. At the end of the day, you were supposed to either take the information off of those three by five cards and put it in some sort of formal archive storage or run them through a shredder. This is similar. There's a lot of information that flips back and forth during the day that really doesn't need to be retained for a long time. If you have something like this, it means that IT doesn't have to deal with questions of data retention and ultimately from the legal side, the problems of discovery. Mm. When a, uh, someone wants to sue you and comes in and wants to see every shred of information that was generated in a given time period, if you have something like this, then that's ephemeral that can't be gotten at during discovery and is no longer IT's problem. This is really a pretty big deal, although, as I said, it's an extension coming out of the paper world rather than something brand new for the digital age. Right, right. Actually, Curtis, I want to stay with you because you can give us that unique enterprise perspective here. We've got Web 5A, or sorry, it scrolled past, 58 something zero in the chat room who's saying, like, as you just said, this is all about accountability. This is all about not wanting to have any incriminating information. If I can make my memos to my employees just disappear, then I don't have that, that electronic trace. I don't have that piece of paper. I don't have that memo or that printout that someone can subpoena. But Untoward in the chat room says, wait a minute, wait a minute. If this becomes the norm in the enterprise, isn't this a huge violation of Sorbanes-Oxley that, that specifically states we have to be able to retain those records in case we want to figure out what happened? Well, again, I think what you have is making a discrimination between the things, as you said, that are a formal memo and therefore would fall under a formal retention policy and those things that in the days before computers were everywhere would have been pieces of scrap paper. And you know as well as I do, if you've got scrap paper around, you'll make little notes to yourself, uh, little, uh, you know, writing down phone numbers, writing down quick notes. You might even hand something to a coworker where you write down somebody's phone number, give it to a coworker because they asked for it. With this kind of information, that very ephemeral, not intended for anything long-term information can be discarded in a routine programmatic way. Now, it, it would be a case that you would want to educate your employees on what's appropriate for this kind of medium and what really does need to be put in a more formal retention policy, uh, say, you know, shoved into a, a SharePoint server or done through standard email. Uh, there are differences. The important thing is that this allows information that should be ephemeral because it has no long-term implications to be ephemeral on a programmatic basis. It's not a question of why did you decide to discard this information? It's everything that is sent via this method is discarded. We didn't discriminate on a case-by-case -case basis. That becomes very important when the lawyers get involved. Right. Actually, that's when I was still working in D.C., that's how it was explained to me, which is if it looks as if you you changed your regular operating procedure in order to destroy documents, that's when SOX can get you. But if this was just a regular way of communicating and uh, it, was, it was part of your M.O., then they don't have as big of a platform to go after you with. But, Chibert, I, I want to get to you because we seem to have struck a chord inside the chat room. We've got uh, EGF Techman who is... Uh, you know, still saying, well, look, SOX still requires you to keep records. We've got uh, um, uh, Retro D who is saying, look, this is this idea of data uh, archiving gets really, really expensive. What is it like on the academic side? We've talked a little bit about the enterprise, but on the academic side, away from Sorbanes-Oxley, you deal with having to keep the trail of, of uh, evidence, of results from the start of an experiment to the end. Oh, yeah, yeah. In fact, you know, even my telephone log for all my voicemail and so forth is written in a laboratory notebook where all the pages are sewn in and I do it in ink. It has saved my bacon several times. Um, 
the thing that keep people keep forgetting is that laboratory notebooks are considered permanent and archival by the courts and can be introduced as evidence. Um, so in an academic community, sometimes a matter of minutes is going to determine who got the patent on some brand new tech that you've mm. created. Uh, it's also who, who publishes first. You know, it's all, when it's publish or perish, if you published even a minute before the other guy, um, you get the credit, not the other guy. Right. Just look at, uh, you know, Edison. <laughs> he didn't invent the light bulb. Someone else did, but he got the patent first. Let's push this to the next, le next level because the story here is actually about Snapchat last week having to respond again to claims that they had been hacked. Last Friday, some hackers, who, many of whom are associated with 4chan, claimed that they broke into Snapchat's database and were able to download years of photos and videos, which already raised eyebrows because those, that, those videos, those photos, those texts, those drawings were supposed to have been deleted off of Snapchat's servers. Well, for its part, Snapchat says it wasn't us. No one hacked our database. What happened was that users were using popular third-party apps to capture Snapchats, thereby making them non-ephemeral, storing them on other providers' databases. Those databases were hacked. Those videos and those photos were stolen. I, I got to throw this out here because it kind of breaks up what ephemeral means. I mean, this, this whole idea of I can send a message and then I can delete it from the Internet. I can, I can take something back if it wasn't supposed to be sent out. I can kill something if it's no longer timely. That's the whole idea. That's the allure of ephemeral messaging. But we know that it's only as ephemeral as you can trust the person you're sharing it with. Uh, Cheaper, let me throw this over to you. Is it really possible to have ephemeral messaging that you can trust? Yeah, I don't know. You know, it's, I, I look at it this way. If you're going to send anything, anything at all, electronically over the Internet, it's not going to go away, no matter how much you want to call it ephemeral. Someone's going to go and save a copy. Someone's going to go and route a copy. Someone's going to do something with a copy of your data because it's way too easy to make copies of digital media. Um, should there be an ephemeral? Yeah, maybe. But then again, pager data is supposed to be ephemeral too, but you can do discovery on pager data. So I don't know. Um, my, I, as far as I'm concerned, jury's still out. I'm not sure I want ephemeral but I can definitely see why some people do. I like what uh, EGF Tech Man in the chat room is saying, which is uh, anything seen by more than one set of eyes is not ephemeral. It can live forever. Let me go over to you, Curtis, because there's another question here that goes beyond whether or not they were hacked or whether or not clients are acting in bad faith by running these third-party apps that allow you to capture and store what are supposed to be ephemeral conversations. And that is... Even if, and it does seem that Snapchat is right in saying that it wasn't their database that was hacked, but it was these third-party databases that were compromised, aren't they acting in bad faith in promoting ephemeral messaging when they fully know that third-party apps don't just exist, but third-party apps thrive using Snapchat's API to capture data that can then be stored off-site, off-device? Uh, it, it would seem to me that you're giving your users a false sense of security and saying, oh, yeah, yeah, go ahead and send this text, and it doesn't matter because you can delete it in 30 days. Well, what we get back to is a word that we hear all the time in security and privacy, and that word is trust. I mean, if you're going to do ephemeral messaging right now, it implies trust on both sides of the transaction, trust uh, on the part of the sender that what they are sending is in fact of an ephemeral nature and trust from the receiver that they will treat it as ephemeral and not use one of these third party applications to try to hang on to it. Uh, to me, the larger issue is that because of these third party apps that we know are out there and we know can skim and save the Snapchat and other ephemeral messaging types, that means that other actors can do this, uh, whether it be a government agency who is using a court-approved wiretap, or its digital equivalent in this case, uh, or a hacker. If they can sniff the stream, they can grab the ephemeral message and make it very non-ephemeral. Under current technology, 
a high level of trust still has to be in place for these messages to be truly ephemeral. Uh, you can set policy based on this, but that policy needs to recognize that somewhere, somehow, someone's going to violate the policy, and you should have an, an enterprise knowledge of what you'll do when that that occurs. Uh, for the rest of us, hey, I think you. I think that you and Chebert are both right. If it goes via the internet, if it goes via the public commodity internet, to be uh, more specific, then we need to assume that it's not truly private. Right. Right. And our, our chat room is right on top of this. We've got a Retro D who is saying ephemeral messaging only makes sense if the sender and receivers can only they can uh, can see it. And if they can agree to let it go, I think you're right, Curtis, it comes down to trust. You have to you have to trust both the sender and the receiver of a messaging. And then we know that in IT, we trust no one. So I guess no. Let's go ahead and move on to our next story before we fall down the ephemeral hole. Talk a little bit about Silk Road. Now, if you have been keeping up to date, you understand what's going on. There's there's actually a lot at stake in the trial of Ross Ulbricht, who has been accused of being the dread pirate Roberts, the mastermind of Silk Road. Now, his defense lawyers have challenged the legitimacy of the evidence against their, their client, and it all hinges on whether or not the FBI acted appropriately in seizing servers in, in Iceland where Silk Road was operating from. Now, the defense lawyers have claimed that all the evidence in the Ulbricht case was gathered from that illegal search. It poisoned the tree. That server was located in Reykjavik, Reykjavik uh, and if that search is ruled illegal, then all of the evidence against Ulbricht would have to be thrown out because without that server, you don't have any of the substantial bits of information you need to convict. Now, for their part, the FBI has claimed that they found the Silk Road server not by a physical search, which would have been illegal, but by doing a malformed data attack on the Silk Road server, which already was encrypted because it was going through the Tor network. They hammered at the server until it aired and return the server's true IP address, not the Tor address. Now, of course, that even that raises eyebrows because it would seem that hammering on a server in order to cause an error would be in direct violation of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, uh, especially since they didn't have a warrant to do this. B before we get straight into the story, Chibert, let me, let me throw this to you because I know you are a little want to rant. The idea that the FBI can, without a warrant, just start hammering at some random server in order to get information, there, there's all sorts of issues I have with, with how, what that does to our privacy. What's your take? Actually, I'd like Jason to go and flip over to that um, URL. Basically, Ars Technica has a really interesting spin on this. The reality is, is at, at the root of this is, is Ulrich Dread Pirate Roberts? And if he doesn't claim that he's associated with the Silk Road servers, then what the FBI has done is, you know, legitimate. But if he isn't, if he is associated with it, that means they have him on a whole bunch of other charges. So that's why I love Ars Technica saying it's a catch-22. Is he or isn't he Dread Pirate Roberts really and truly is the basis for the, the court case and, you know, yes, maybe it's illegal, but maybe it isn't. You know, it's for the courts to decide because realistically our, led, our congressional delegations and, you know, the executive branch have not really defined it well. So it's now up to the judicial branch to, to set what is and isn't the correct interpretation of each law. And that's, I think, what's going to happen. And at the key, at the basis of this, the pivot point for all this is, is he or isn't he Dread Pirate Roberts? And I'm going to love to see how he handles this Catch-22. Right. Uh, of course, the Catch-22 that you were referring to is uh, what's happening in the case right now. Uh, it, what it boils down to this is this. They're claiming that the search was illegal. It's a violation of his constitutionally protected rights to privacy. What the judge, Judge Force, has decided is that, no, it's not, because the server was not claimed. Ulbricht never claimed ownership of the server. If he does not claim ownership of the server, then he cannot assert a constitutionally guaranteed right to privacy. On the other hand, if he did claim the rights to the server, the ownership of the server and the data contained within, 
then Ars Technica and others are saying he's admitting guilt. What the prosecutors have said is that there's actually a third way out. He could have claimed ownership of the server, thereby saying that they did not have the right to violate his privacy when they went through that server. And at the same time, he could have refused in court to identify himself as the owner of the server under the, the protection of his Fifth Amendment rights. It, it gets really, really confusing, but here's, here's where I, I want to bring Curtis in here. This idea that is being used by this judge, Judge Force, and by the FBI that unclaimed entities on the internet, be they servers, be they computers, be their IP addresses, are somehow not covered by privacy uh, uh, protections because as unclaimed property, we don't know who owns them and therefore the FBI should feel free to go through them, is incredibly troublesome. Because in this day and age, unless you're keeping it on premise, and of course there's been a big push to push everything into the cloud, it would seem that you no longer can proactively claim ownership of anything on the internet. Uh, of Curtis, my question to you is, if that's the case, what enterprise or business in their right mind would put any sensitive information off premise? Well, it, get, it gets even better than that because what we have here, uh, the, the judge and a bunch of the lawyers all keep coming back to the notion of the server. And as we know, in an era of not only the cloud, but virtualization, even, even in a hosted situation, where you absolutely already know which box you're sitting on, what you have bought is an instance of an operating system. You don't claim ownership of the entire box that it sits on. And the laws that we're dealing with right now are all set up to cover the boxes, not the information that sits on them, not the applications that are running on them, the boxes. This is something that actually was talked about last week at Gartner Symposium from a slightly different angle. You know, from accounting perspectives, all of the petabytes of data that sit, for example, in Walmart's uh, data stores, in eBay's data stores, in Facebook's data stores, from an accounting perspective, that data has no value, zero. It cannot count on the company's balance sheets at all. The only assets that those companies have are the physical servers, the physical disk systems. What we're running into now is a situation where we know, those of us in the industry, that the information has value, that the data is a, should be a legal thing, a legal entity that can be owned separate from where it sits. From the accounting system to the tax system to the legal system, none of those have caught up yet. And how they catch up, the rules and laws that are established to describe the value and the ownership of the data is going to be one of the biggest battles that is fought over the next five to 10 years. Because let's face it, the, the implied value of all of that data is easily into the many trillions of dollars. Right, right. Chibert, let me throw to you because uh, again, I, I want to push this idea. We've got people in the chat room who are rightfully saying, look, cloud is great for backup, for, for well-planned backup. But the problem is you can't claim ownership of something if you don't own it completely. I, I'm thinking of cloud services. You don't know what box your files reside. In fact, you don't even know what, what data center, you don't even know what continent your data might be if it's, if it's geographically balanced across a network. So claiming ownership as the FBI defines it would seem to be almost impossible to do on the internet. If it's impossible to do on the internet, then that means that that data has no protections. A according to the United States Constitution and what your, are your constitutionally guaranteed rights to privacy, if you put something in the cloud, you might as well just be handing it to the FBI. Well, I'm actually going to peek down a little bit of a rabbit hole and do a little bit of historical here. Keep in mind that right at this very moment, if a corporation donates a million dollar piece of software to an academic institution, they can't claim nothing on their taxes because the uh, United States tax law doesn't consider it of value. 
this is a problem and it's been a problem for many, many decades. Oh, hell, it's been a pro problem ever since software came to be. And it's really and truly something that the uh, legislative branch and the executive branch need to work on because it's basically the difference between the United States and a lot of the rest of the world. So let, let's use an example. I'm going to really go off in the rabbit hole. Um, the Japanese have had a really, really tough time getting really good programmers because traditionally in Japan, a programmer is no better than a secretary, or at least it has been in the past. They value engineers, but they don't value software producers. This is something that's happening worldwide. You know, is it something that needs to be fixed? Yes, indeed. Is it something the United States really needs to deal with? I certainly agree with that. Um, are the, is our legislative branch, branches going to do something? I sure as heck hope so. So the reality is, is yeah, there's an awful lot of people, folks in the chat room saying, no, we're not going to use public cloud services and for very good reasons. But, you know, hey, things change. You know, originally uh, debit cards had no protection. Now they do. Credit cards originally had no protection. Now they do. Well, maybe software and data out from the cloud right now have no protection. Maybe it needs to be done. Gentlemen, thank you very much. I think uh, this is going to develop, especially as as uh, several people in the chat room have said, when this hits mainstream media and people realize what are the ramifications of some of these privacy cases, we're probably going to hear a lot more of it. Until then, geeks like myself will probably just have to turn to the arresting agent and say, hello, my name is Padre SJ. You stole my data. Prepare to die. Now, when we come back, we're going to welcome Cameron Crandall from Kingston. He's going to tell us all about super fast, crazy fast enterprise class storage running through your PCIe bus. But before that, let's welcome a brand new sponsor to the Twilight Riot. It's Mandrel. Now, these days, the vast majority of our attention is given to the latest in social, the greatest messaging app, the trendiest in collaboration. But for serious businesses and enterprises, there is still, after all these years, way after its inception, nothing more pervasive, more useful, and more important than email. That's why we're, welcome, well, we're happy to welcome Mandrel to the Twilight Riot. It's a scalable, reliable, and secure email infrastructure service trusted by more than 300 thousand customers now what is mandrel you might be asking yourself well it's the easiest way to manage integrate deliver track and analyze emails it sports detailed delivery reports advanced analytics and a friendly interface that makes it easy for your entire team or from developers to marketers to monitor and evaluate email performance across your business uh, you can use manual to send automated one touch emails like password resets and welcome messages as well as marketing emails and customized newsletters they started as an idea in 2010, and now they're the largest email-as-a-service platform on the market. Because they've geolocated their servers to maximize response times, Mandrel can deliver your emails in milliseconds. And they've given you all the webhooks and analytics that developers need to check delivery rates and the documentation to make integration a breeze. Now, speaking of integration, Mandrel is easy to set up and integrate with your existing apps. It comes with a beautiful interface, flexible template options, custom tagging, and advanced tracking and reports. It's also the only email infrastructure service with a mobile app that lets you monitor delivery and troubleshoot from wherever you are in the world. Now, here's what we want you to do. We want you to try Mandrel. Mandrel is powerful, scalable, and affordable, but you don't have to take our word for it. Right now, Mandrill is offering a special deal to members of the TWIT audience. Sign up at mandrill.com, promo code TWIT, and you'll receive 50,000 free emails per month for your first six months of service. That's M-A-N-D-R-I-L-L.com, promo code TWIT. And we thank Mandrill for the support of this week in Enterprise Tech. We welcome to the show Mr. Cameron Crandall. He was here actually a few months back talking about Kingston SSD products, and uh, we welcomed him to talk about the next generation, the super fast generation of SSD. Cameron, thank you for coming back on to the show. Glad to be back again. Thanks. Now, uh, Cameron, for, for the last couple of years, the SSD industry has been hankering to move away from the SATA and SAS host interfaces. 
Now, why is that? I mean, on the consumer level, that, that seems perfect. It seems fine. It seems as if SSDs are, are great. The only devices that can really fill up the SATA and SAS interfaces. Why, why has there been a push to something else? Well, the SATA and SAS interface is, um, uh, is, is basically slows down the SSD. You know, we, we put that host interface in front of those um, fast controllers and flash NAND chips, and the, we introduce latency. Um, we have a maximum uh, data rate of, uh, you know, theoretically 600 megabytes per second. It's a single port. Um, in the case of SAS, now we do have uh, 12 gigabit per second, but even that is limiting compared to uh, PCI Express. So really the, 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 the SATA and SAS host interface, while they were great uh, for the introduction of SSDs into the marketplace several years ago, uh, looking beyond those interfaces is what's going to give us kind of the next big jump in, uh, in SSD performance, not only bandwidth performance, but also IOPS performance. Right, right. Now, we know that SATA revision 3 can handle 6 gigabits per second, and uh, SAS, what's the most recent version is, I, I forget, what, how, what's the transfer rate on that now? It's 12 gigabit per second. Right, so you're telling me that we want more than 6 and 12 gigabits per second. We do, we do. And mm. uh, PCI Express will, will deliver that. It's, it's, it's about 500 megabytes a second per lane. Um, wow. So if you've got a, a by 4 slot or a by 8 slot, um, Obviously, in a single device, you can achieve far more performance uh, through PCI Express than you can with uh, uh, serial ATA and SAS. PCI Express also gives us uh, more power. So in the PCI Express sl slot, uh, we have 25 watts to work with, and power is key to fast SSDs. Right, right, exactly. So you're going up from five watts to is it tw yeah twenty five watts? Twenty five watts, yeah. Yeah. All right, now let me let me ask you a little bit something about that because I actually I'm a big user of Kingston products. I use them in all our know how projects. They're they're in my servers. They're in my uh, my desktops back in my office in my studio. But I top out about what five hundred and fifty megabytes per second read and probably five hundred and twenty five megabytes per second write. Uh, there are a couple of SSDs that go a little bit higher, very close to the limitations of of, uh, of of SATA, but how? I mean, I, I know how fast PCIe can go. How can you get that much speed out of a flash controller, out of a flash subsystem? Uh, through multiple lanes and multiple channels um, internally on on the controller and drive itself. So uh, we really don't have a problem uh, getting the performance out of uh, out of a PCI Express bus. Um, the controller is not the limiting factor. We're still, uh, we're still hung up by the by the host interface. So we want that uh, we want that, that 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 fast interface with PCI Express. Okay, I I know that you're working on a few things at Kingston. You may not be able to discuss them entirely with me right now, but let's talk a little bit about the field in general. This whole idea of ultra fast SSD storage delivered through PCIe. I think the first commercially available product was released maybe even six or seven years ago. Uh, the first PCIe uh, drop-in card that provided right. ridiculous amounts of speed. I know right. Fusion I.O. made a huge yep. splash at an interop yep. showing off dozens of screens all being played with high definition, the definition at the same time, showing off ridiculous amounts of bandwidth and IOPS. But what do you need to, to get close to saturating, say, a PCIe uh, times four bus? Uh, what, what kind of technology goes behind that? Is it just a bunch of connected uh, standard SATA drives, or are we just we actually making a, a, a custom product here? You mean in terms of uh, a PCI Express device, or can we reach the same performance levels with SATA and SAS just aggregating across drives? Sorry, I didn't. Right, right. So, so for example, um, I, I saw at CES a few years back, there was a, uh, I, I should have brought up a picture of it. There was this wonderful device that you had built. I think it was your group that built it, that had a RAID controller connected to, was it 16? Uh, 16 SSDs. Right. Yeah. And it was ridiculously fast. Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm guessing that's not what you're talking about when you think of, of native PCIe fast SSD storage you're thinking of no, so yeah good question yeah great question so um, so yeah we can we can um, we can aggregate uh, SSDs um, across a multi-port RAID controller and uh, and we can get fantastic performance out of that but still uh, being natively attached to the PCI Express bus 
uh, is still faster than a rated solution. The rate controller itself has has its own overhead. Uh, it has its own rate engine. It's got it has its own processor, its own memory. Um, we're still faster uh, attached directly to the uh, to the PCI Express bus. And with the the rate controllers that are in the market, even though those are those are still great solutions, and they they follow the traditional storage model, uh, we're still hampered by that. SATA and SAS uh, uh, layer there, which we, we need to eliminate. So even though we're, we're, we're rating multiple drives together, we're still somewhat hindered by the SATA and SAS interface. Right. Uh, can you draw me a picture? What does the landscape of PCIe manufacturers look like right now? I know Fusion IO has had a, a little bit of trouble uh, with financing, but who are the major players? When you look around at PCIe Express, uh, PCIe Express flash memory products for the enterprise specifically, who is offering? So Fusion IO is, is, is obviously the big one. Um, they've been incredibly successful over the last several years, uh, bringing very high performance uh, PCI Express SSDs to the marketplace. Others have jumped in since then. Um, Intel uh, is in this market now. Uh, in, Intel and, uh, and Fusion, IO, Fusion IO are probably the, the, the two most dominant um, names in in the enterprise space. Right, right. Uh, where does violin fit in there? Uh, Violin's more of a um, more of an appliance solution, Got so it. they they deliver a, a complete solution. But if we're talking about just PCI Express cards, um, you know, Fusion IO definitely on the on the enterprise side has this market. Um, Intel is getting into it. Kingston will eventually get into this market. Um, but I think. Uh, I think we need new form factors to be able to get mass adoption in the, uh, the PCI Express market. Right, right. And, uh, of course, okay, here's, here's a question that everyone in the audience is going to have. They see that PCI Express SSDs can be much faster, of course. But what's the, the price comparison here? In the, in the, in the ultra-fast SSD market, you can now get something going below $0.50 cents per gigabyte. Yep. What is it going to be for PCI Express? So PCI Express solutions for the enterprise are, are still, you know, north of, uh, of $10,000 a drive, obviously, depending <laughs> on capacity. Yeah, it's, it, it, is a, it is a big investment, and that's one of the drawbacks of, of PCI Express. They're, they're, very much a, they're very much a niche product today, and you have to find a customer that has uh, an application that can take advantage of all of those, the, those IOPS that those cards deliver and have the budget to, to be able to afford uh, to integrate those types of solutions. And again, we, we you know, here at Kingston, we really view that market as being more niche, and that's really why we've stayed out of that market over the last several years. But we've, we've got plans to, to, to jump into it here next year. Right. I mean, obviously, at that price point, there's, there's going to be very few who are going to be able to justify that much of a premium for what is obviously a lot of performance, but you know, not a whole lot more depending on what they do. So that's the next question, which is, which businesses, which enterprises could actually benefit from something like a PCI Express mass storage controller? So a lot of the companies that are using these devices today um, are trying to speed up uh, large scale databases, um, you know, increase lookup times, uh, but it's primarily database customers uh, that have a need for for this type of uh, of performance. Um, some transactional uh, uh, applications can use it, like OLTP, uh, it, but it's typically a, a transaction based play, uh, as well as speeding up databases. So these are really the customers that are that are jumping into this market. But on on the, on the cost side, um, for the for the viewers, you know, you may be asking yourself, why are these PCI Express solutions so expensive? And the reason why they're so expensive is uh, because their designs are so proprietary, and that the drivers that they mm -hmm. use are very, very proprietary. So if you look at a, you know, a, a PCI Express solution, you've got a you got a small army of of, of hardware and software engineers uh, behind a product like that, because you're not building off of standards. You're building a, a, a custom solution with a SATA and SAS device. You know, we we build drives from from a standard, and that's what keeps that cost low. So with PCI Express, what we have coming out is uh, something called NVM Express. And NVM Express will bring standardization as to how we attach uh, SSDs to the PCI Express bus 
and then that will begin to bring the cost of PCI Express solutions down. I, I would imagine that that would also make it very difficult for you to roll out any sort of solution with so many competing proprietary standards if you want to to integrate a ultra fast storage solution into let's say your your database service you you'd have to be able to use their drivers you'd have you need support from that company to make sure that you're going to act uh, access that storage as efficiently as possible uh, and this what's this new standard you were talking about we, we might move it's, to a, a new way to attach yeah, them it's it yeah so it's called nvm express it's 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 getting more and more mature um, but NVM Express will bring standard, standardized drivers, just like we have for SATA and SAS, standardized drivers for attaching SSDs to the PCI Express bus. And then once we've got those standards, then we'll be we'll begin to see the costs, you know, coming down on uh, on these on these devices. Let me throw you some questions that we're getting from the chat room. Uh, we've got JJ to the four eight eight four wondering if is there any way to maybe integrate some sort of hybrid solution using this PCI attached SSD uh, or at, at these prices and at this performance, it just doesn't make sense. Yeah, I haven't seen any hybrid solutions based on, on PCI. Well, I take that back. I mean, uh, some of the hybrid solutions that are in the marketplace today in terms of, uh, of software um, enable you to use um, any device, any, any SSD device, whether it's SATA, SAS, or PCI Express. So, so yes, there are caching solutions to maybe speed up uh, slow uh, spinning disk arrays um, with your choice of, of SSD. Um, so yeah, these these products do exist in the marketplace. Um, they're they're software products. You go out and, and bring your own SSD. You get to choose the technology that you want at the price point that you want. Uh, they just need a, a basically a flash device to to cache to. So yeah, these these products are on the marketplace. And uh, M-Face in our chat room is wondering, what's the useful life of a PCI-attached SSD versus a SAS or a SATA-attached SSD? It, it, it shouldn't be any less, right? I mean, it, you're still doing the same operations. You're still having to go through a controller. You're still using the, the same flash memory chips. Yeah, so the, uh, the, the work, it's really depending on, on work. That depends on workload. So the same thing we, we, we do on the 2.5-inch uh, 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 SATA uh, versions of SSDs that we sell, we typically want to understand the workload so that we can make the right recommendation of SSD to fit that particular workload. So we're not recommending drives that are going to go into an application that are going to uh, exhaust their program array cycles in, you know, in six months or a year. So uh, the, the the useful life of an SSD really depends on the workload that we that we throw at it. Right. Uh, let, let me let me come. To my first question from the other side, uh, when I was asking, okay, well, who should be using a PCIe Express uh, attached, a PCIe attached SSD? Who shouldn't be using it? I mean, looking at what you know, and let's take price out of it. So let's say price was not an object. Are there certain businesses and enterprises that just won't see any benefit to using PCIe attached SSDs? Yeah, if you if you don't require the the um, the extreme performance that a PCI Express uh, device gives you, you, you definitely, you, know, you don't need to spend the extra money on that. Um, if you require serviceability in your drives um, in terms of hot plugging um, or hot swapping uh, failed drives, so if you're uh, putting uh, critical data on a, on, a, on a PCIe card and that card fails, um, unless you're mirroring to another PCI Express card, which drives the cost way up, um, you know, you ha you don't have any redundancy in, 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 a, in a PCI Express solution, um, and then the serviceability aspect of it. One of the one of the key drawbacks of PCI Express half height, half length cards is they are not serviceable from the front of the of the server. So, if you require more of the the traditional storage model, where you can walk up to the front of the server, remove a failed drive, plug in a new one all while the system's up and running without any loss of data and without your users knowing that PCI Express isn't, isn't the solution for you. I want to move on. I'm going to bring in my co-host here uh, to, to talk a little bit about the design of servers that are going to use PCIe attached SSDs because I know it's, it's, it can be a little bit different. Chiebert, let me start with you. I understand that you're looking at building some custom servers that will be using PCIe attached SSDs. 
Yeah, right now we're doing a compromise. Um, like I'm specking out a couple of big super micro servers that have a uh, disk on basically disk on chip. It's the super micro calls them DOM modules. Okay. They're still SATA threes, so it's not it's not what we're, we're you know we're not talking apples to apples comparison here. But right at this moment, it's what's affordable. And what's driving this is really, really big models. Uh, we're actually running massively parallel models uh, to simulate um, you know, clouds, you know, how, how are clouds moving around so that we can go and predict when photovoltaic arrays become occluded by clouds. Makes a pretty big difference, and it's going to be a very key thing for um, sustainable energy. Now, one of the things we would like to do someday, especially when we start dealing with um, uh, high-performance computing, is PCIe-based um, storage, because then we can move large portions of module, um, models in and out. So I see science as being one of your first customers. In fact, I believe Cray is uh, hinting that their Tesla card-based, GPU-based system is going to eventually have a PCIe-based uh, storage system so we can move those models in and out very, very quickly. So I figure oil, anyone that does large scale modeling, oil, weather, those are probably going to be some of the first customers because they can afford and need the speed. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, th again, those are those are vertical, vertical markets, niche, niche vertical markets that are those are ideal candidates for for PC Express. Mm. Uh, uh, let, let me talk about those markets. If, if we were to look at the next generation, or maybe the next, next, next generation, because I'm thinking within three generations, any high-performance server will require a PCIe-attached SSD. It's just going to be part of the spec. What needs to change? What becomes the bottleneck? Because obviously it's not going to be the storage. Yeah, so I, I think for, um, if your question's along the lines of adoption, I think my, my, my personal feeling is that in order to get broad-based mass adoption of PCI Express, we need it in a, in a removable form factor, whether that's 2.5 inch or it's uh, the new M.2 form factor. Um, it needs to be front-loading and it needs to be removable um, to get the, 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 the big volume um, that we see uh, with, with SATA and SAS. So we need to give the customer the option to configure their servers uh, or even storage arrays with um, with either SATA or SAS connectivity or PCI Express connectivity. Now, there are two and a half inch PCI Express drives beginning to enter the marketplace now. Um, there are a, a couple of server brands that are that are supporting this. One is Dell. Uh, they were kind of early pioneers of, of, of two and a half inch PCI Express. Uh, and I understand that Supermicro is, is going to be coming out with a chassis that also supports two and a half inch PCI Express. But I think in order to get the, that mass adoption, we need to make it front loading. Um, it needs to be in some sort of a removable form factor, and the customer needs to make be able to make, have the, the the choice of a SATA SAS interface or PCI Express. And then we'll start to see um, more and more customers gravitating towards PCI Express because the performance benefits are. Are, are so much greater right curtis let me bring you in here because i think uh, he, he actually just brought up a hugely important point for anyone who is managing it looking at storage uh, that whole idea of hot swappability the whole idea of front loading so you can minimize downtime the ability to pull a bad module and pull a new one in that's what's kept a lot of it shops from migrating to crazy fast pcie attached ssds because of the idea that I have to sh I have to power down a server and open it up in order to be able to swap out a faulty module. If if they were able to bring down the price, if they were able to solve the front loading uh, issue and make it hot swappable, does this become a no brainer on the enterprise side? If you're buying your next set of servers and let's say the price is is five x over what a standard flash storage solution would be. Do, do you not even think about the slower SSDs? I think you're exactly right. Uh, the big thing that you don't want any new technology to, to, to do is make your system more brittle to make it so that a failure is has a greater impact on operation and takes longer to recover from. And as you point out, this whole hot swappable issue has been huge. If they solve that, 
and help on the price issue, then I think this becomes a must-have technology. Again, going back to what all of the experts were saying last week at Gartner, there are two trends especially that this feeds into. One is that everyone assumes that what Gartner calls the Internet of Everything rather than the Internet of Things, um, that that's going to increase by order upon order of magnitude the volume of data that must be dealt with in order to do reasonable analysis of the environment around an, um, an enterprise. The other thing is that everyone, I think, sees deep analytics moving from self-contained applications into uh, functions within every application. So within your standard retail POS, there will be analytics that not only tell you what has just happened, but predict what is about to happen so that salespeople can more successfully upsell a particular customer. When you have that kind of deep analytics occurring around vastly more data, the speed issues become critical. If you can get that speed without increasing brittleness and without increasing by an order of magnitude the price of the system, then I think you have something that goes into the magic row of tick boxes that servers have to have. Fantastic. I, I do want to ask one last ca uh, question, Cameron. And again, I'm not sure how much you can answer, uh, but I'm going to poke you anyways and put you on the spot so I can get an answer. I've heard this rumor that Kingston has been avoiding this PCIe uh, attached SSD specifically because of those issues, the cost and the non hot swap ability and not front load ability. But I've also heard that you might be working on a solution for that. Can you talk about that at all? Yeah, so um, so yeah, so we have stayed out of this market for, for quite some time. Um, Kingston, uh, we very much deal in volume here. Um, and because that market was more niche, it's a, it, it's a market that we've stayed out of. Obviously, the, the, the volume has been in, in, in serial ATA attached devices because we can we can plug them into notebooks, desktops, and servers. Um, but we've seen more and more interest uh, from from our customer base in uh, in PCI Express solutions. So we're going to go to market initially in the consumer enthusiast space. So we'll produce um, uh, some PCI Express cards that are, are are geared and marketed towards the enthusiast customer, the gamer. Um, we're all going to be also going to be coming out with um, PCI Express in the M.2 form factor. If you haven't heard about M.2, it's a new um, mm -hmm. uh, PCB form factor for, for SSDs. Um, so we'll enter the market that way. And then in about the middle of next year, uh, we'll come out with a half height, half length uh, PCI Express card uh, for servers. And then we'll be uh, competing more with the, uh, the Intels and the uh, uh, Fusion IOs. And that product... Uh, will more than likely be MBM Express at that time, which is that that standard I was talking about that's going to bring costs down, make connectivity easier, um, and so forth. I, I know you can't give me numbers, and it would be it would be wrong for me to prod you for numbers, but could you give me comparative numbers? What kind of performance boost would, say, the consumer-level product expect over standard SATA-connected SSD? Uh, and, and then when we're looking at, you, you were calling it Fusion I.O.-level performance, um, are you looking at one-upping them, or are you looking at saying, okay, this is a good performance spot, we're going to stay here? Yeah, from that standpoint, it would be a good performance spot, stay here. Um, I, I, our initial products will be um, uh, PCI Express devices that uh, initially put out between 1,700 and 2,000 megabytes a second out of a single <laughs> device. Versus 550 megabytes a second out of a SATA device. I'm sorry. I'm just I can look at a, I'm laughing over here. Uh, so the other question I have is, uh, uh, can we get a review unit? Sure. Can, can we just borrow that for some testing? Sure. <laughs> I, I can't tell if you're joking. Oh, we'll, we'll talk oh, afterwards. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's amazing. So I, I'm looking at a three-fold performance increase over the fastest SSD I currently got in my box just Correct. by dropping in a PCIe. Correct. What? Yeah. Okay. Wait, what? <laughs> Wait, can we go to Chebert? Chebert, are you, are you having as hard of a time as I am here? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. 
Gbert <laughs> won't. Gbert yeah. won't. <laughs> uh, Curtis, you don't care about speed, right? Um, oh, of, of course not. I, I would I would probably turn down faster things on principle. I'm I'm going to stick with my abacus as long as possible. Of course, I want a faster drive. Jeez. Oh, I mean, essentially, what you're doing is you're telling me that you've built that box, that that wonderful rig that you created for CES, and you're putting it on a card. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, and again, price point. Price point. I know you can't you can't give me a price point, but comparatively, what are we looking at? Actually, I'm not sure. Okay. I, when it comes to pricing, I'm pretty dense. Yeah. But yep. uh, should be actually, it shouldn't be too much more than what, than what you're paying today for for SAT and SAS. There will be a, a slight uptick, but it won't be it won't be crazy expensive. Uh, I have to say, uh, I seriously, I I don't get flustered much, but you just made a bunch of geeks kind of wander <laughs> around. I, oh, wow. Okay, that, that's a lot. Well. Calm it back down. Gentlemen, I want to thank you so very much for being on this panel, for, for having this discussion. I'm sorry we we have used up another hour of your time uh, listening to the best dang enterprise podcast in the world. That's according to 9 out of 10 super fast SSDs. But I want to thank all the panelists who made this possible. Let's start with you, Chibert. Uh, what, what should the Twilight Riot know about you? What are you doing? What are you up to uh, other than connecting to the Iridium satellite network? Well, I am trying really hard to eat the learning curve and try and figure out how to make Federation play nice with OpenLDAP because most universities do not want you synchronizing passwords from the LDAP into Active Directory. They want you to have just users in Active Directory and authenticate against LDAP. It's actually a lot harder than anyone would think, and um, I'm taking a lot of aspirin to try and keep the headaches down. Speaking of headaches, uh, Curtis Franklin, are you doing any more traveling, my friend, or, or do you get to stay home for a while? I actually get to stay home for a little while, and I'm very pleased about that. Uh, I think the next time I'm scheduled to go out is probably somewhere around CES in January, and uh, that's a nice luxury to be able to stay at home. But I, I tell you, I am working on a project, and I would love to have some input from, uh, from our Twiat listeners. If you've had a mentor, if you've had someone who helped you in your IT career, whether it's a teacher early or, or an early manager or just, you know, some older person who has offered advice and, and encouraged you, I'd love to know about that. I'm putting together a series on mentor stories. So if you would drop me a, an email, curtis.franklin at ubm.com, I'd appreciate it. I uh, would like to hear about your mentor stories. Gentlemen, as you know, it is always a pleasure to spend time with you. Speaking of a pleasure to spend time with, Cameron, thank you so very much for coming back on The Twiat. And again, I think that that last statement just kind of busted us up a little bit. But this was a lot of knowledge that you dropped on us about PCIe attached SSD storage products. Could you please tell the folks at home where they can find you, where they can find Kingston, where they can find out more information about developments uh, in your department? Sure, yeah. So I can be reached at Cameron underscore Crandall at Kingston.com. And obviously our website is www.kingston.com. Thank you. And uh, we will have you back in, uh, when do you think you'll have a product release? Probably January or so? Uh, for PCI Express, uh, hopefully December, but it could bleed into January. So yeah, first of the year. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll definitely have you back to do an on-live demonstration because okay. uh, there's nothing more fun. That'd be great. Take care. Folks, I also want to thank you. That's right, our loyal audience. You make this show possible by downloading This Week in Enterprise Tech. If it wasn't for you, we wouldn't be here to talk about all the coolest, the latest, the greatest, the hottest in the enterprise. So we want to do something for you. We want to make it easier for you to get every episode of Twiat. Just go to our show page at twit.tv slash twiat. You'll find a little drop-down menu above all of our episodes that will give you options to get Twiat downloaded in the format of your choice into the device of your choice. If you want the audio version in your iPhone so you can listen to us on the way to work, or you want to drop the video version on your Android tablet so you can watch us in your break, or if you want the super high-definition version on your Mac or your PC so you can watch it at home, it's all right there. Also, as long as you're going to subscribe to the show, why not follow me on Twitter? You can find me at twitter.com slash PadreSJ. That's at PadreSJ. If you follow me, you'll be able to suggest topics for future shows. And you'll be able to find out what we're going to be doing each week before every episode. 
You'll also see what I do here on the Twit Network when I'm not on This Week in Enterprise Tech. That includes Padres Corner, 7.30 p.m. on Tuesdays. Know How, 11 o'clock a.m. on Thursdays. Coding 101 with Shannon Morse at 1.30. Make sure to drop by and uh, see if maybe we've got something for you. I also want to thank everyone here at the Twit Brick House who makes this show possible. To Carson, my super producer, to Lisa and Leo, and to Jason, my most excellent TD. Sir, I understand that you can drop some Android. Where are you going? <laughs> oh, it's a good question here. Let me come back. I, okay, there we go. I understand Sorry. you can drop some Android knowledge on us, sir. Uh, I try uh, with with my friends, of course. We do all about Android Tuesdays. That's twit.tv slash AAA with Gina Trapani and Ron Richards. And then every Friday, I do Android App Arena. That's like four to five awesome new apps for your Android device if you're into that sort of thing. And that's twit.tv slash arena. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you. And folks, I'm Father Robert Ballas there, just reminding you that if you know want to know what's going on in the enterprise... Just keep quiet. Sweet.